Hey, a pleasant good day, everybody. This is the next edition of The Grittiest Take, as I'm joined by a great, the great producer, Travis Ballinghoff, I hope I pronounced that correctly, of um, the Nasty Knuckles. He does the great stuff for Cote and Dynasty over there. They had Coatsy on. Try to say Cote, Cote seven times fast. Uh, they had them him on earlier this week. Definitely go check that out. Have to check that one out still myself. The one with Carter Hart, Carter Hart, was very good. The one with uh, Morin. Uh, you guys had Morin on too, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, that was that was pretty cool because that one I liked because it was before all the stuff came out, but you could tell he was in a happy place still. Uh-huh. And when the stuff came out, it made you feel a lot better about the fact that like it, it still sucks, but it made you feel a lot better about the fact he had to end it the way he did because he looked so happy while talking to you guys about where he was in life. He's probably still going to get to stay in hockey, all of that type of stuff. Right. But. When we hop into it, I think the first biggest topic on Flyers fans' minds before we get into the coaching stuff is what affects the coaching is what direction is this team going? And most seasons, Trav, I think you could kind of peg it as somebody that covers a team, as a fan, as somebody that does both. Both me and you, we both go to games and will sometimes go as covering it. You can't peg it. You can't really put your finger on one way or another this year because you have some outlets that are going, oh, well, they're probably going to do X, Y, and Z, which would signal more of a retool. You have others that are going, okay, this will signal more of a, like John Tortorella, signal more of a, let's kind of run it back, try to get it going again next year. And then you have the minority, which is, oh, well, they should just, uh, they're going to rebuild. They should rebuild, I don't think, is the minority, but the people that think they actually are going to do it, I think that's the minority. Where Where is your head at? Like, if you were the – like, basically as, like, a chair GM, what would be your decision for the Flyers? What's the best route for them to try to run it next year, to try to rebuild or try to kind of do that retool on the fly? Type if thing? I if I was GM, I'd be blowing it up. I'd be doing a full-term rebuild. Uh, but like you said, I don't think they're going to end up doing that. Um, the way I see it is – I've seen this team just in and out, kind of the Ron Hextall retool, right? That's what he did. And, you know, they'd, they'd either make the wild card and get bounced first round or they just missed the playoffs by a couple of points. And then I just don't see that as a good way to build a hockey club. I feel like you kind of like everything in life. You either got to be all in or all out. You can't have one foot halfway in the yeah. door, you know? And that's exactly how uh, the one guy we do steal flyers stuff with pure life. Forget I'm trying to think of the exact literature he uses to describe, but he's always like, it's something like a substitute for bubble teams. Like the worst thing to be in a sport is a continuous, consistent bubble team. Cause it's not mm-hmm. going to get you anywhere. Unless if you have that weird season, the flyers did where Michael Layton and freaking Brian Boucher were the goaltender. <laughs> and somehow they got to the Stanley cup against the, yeah. but that doesn't happen often. So you have to be able to, or the, Blues when they were god awful and then great in the second half, and then an ECHL goaltender Benny, then who's still in the NHL today, becomes a good goaltender and wins in the Stanley Cup. So there are odd scenarios, but it doesn't happen often with the Flyers. I agree with you completely. That's what um I, I think the Flyers will be best to re- rebuild it, but they're not going to do it because they know with the fan. Well, it's not even that. I think it's they worry with the fan base that it will be bad if they rebuild, even though the fan base from everything I read and pay attention to seems to be the ones telling them, no, 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 no. It's actually probably better if you do rebuild because otherwise you're just going to be this whole cycle repeating in four years. Mm -hmm. So like, I feel like it's just a disconnect that we really wouldn't have had. And I hate to always go back to this point, but this is a disconnect we wouldn't have had if the Schneider family still owned the team. Like, I feel like these are disconnects that happen because the new culture of the team and, that's just an unfortunate reality, I think, of the present of the team. I completely agree with you. I think a lot of fans actually realize this team needs a full-on rebuild. The team lacks high-end talent, and we'll get into this a little bit later. There actually seems to be some high-end talent out there on the market, which is not a common denominator. That doesn't happen a ton. So maybe they can actually build on their flaws. But the easiest way, it seems like, to build the high-end talent in your team is to tear it down, have three or four really bad seasons, build up the draft picks, the lottery picks, take your chance that way. I think a lot of fans realize that is probably the way they should go, especially because you have some really bad contracts on this team, and it's going to be hard to contend with that. But I guess Chuck wants to save his job and just balls to the wall. Let's, Let's compete this year. Yeah, and the other thing I know with Steele and others, I've talked about this, when I've looked at it more and more, Chuck Fletcher 
has made some good moves into this course. Like the Niskin and one with the Flyers is probably one of the better ones. Um, with the Wild, there was a couple moves he made during his time there that you would say were decent trades. But with the draft, he normally delegates to Flair. So when you compliment the draft, it took me a few years of him being here to really talk to people to realize this, but he doesn't do much. So like when you're kind of saying, oh, well, at least at the draft, you're not even complimenting Chuck Fletcher, you're complimenting yeah. <laughs> Brett Flair. So like realistically, Chuck Fletcher hasn't done anything in a year and a half. Yeah. Like that's like that's that that's why I'm like, how does this dude still have a job? Like, like, like you have Flair drafted well. We're like, okay, cool. We picked Tyson Forster. And every time somebody says, I'm like, I know I like Tyson Forster, but you want to know who picked him? Brett. So like, why why is he not the GM? Like, like if it was me. And I agree with you. I would rebuild. But the other thing I would have done, like, if I wasn't the GM and I was like, Dave, I would have said, we need to promote. You have two guys here that are, dra- quote unquote, love paying attention to prospects in the draft, the Danny Briere and Flair. So those two just personality wise seem like they would work well together because they both are draft prospect gurus. So I feel like if you let Brett, if he wanted to, similar to like the kind of Phillies thing right now, um, where Joe got let go and Rob became the, uh, manager after they were together for all these years. I think that would have made more sense because Brent has done so good with the draft. The Flyers' best thing of Chuck Fletcher's era has been finding these diamond in the rough, like Danoyes and all those types of guys, Zade Wisdom. So, like all these types of guys in the draft, Ronnie Adder. So, mm-hmm. like th- that is kind of been Brent. So, I think if anybody deserved to still be here from that regime, it would have been Brent to be the GM, let Danny be the assistant instead of a Dwight Schrute role of whatever the hell a special assistant to the yeah. general manager so uh like i think that would have made a lot more sense but that's just kind of looking at it from the outside they make the decisions but i know i think a lot of the fan base if they had to pick i would think most of them would say by mid-season chuck will be going anyway like i, I see that happening as well yeah but we can move into it we'll move into since this kind of segues good into the coaches because that goes perfectly with what direction we think the team is going. Cause if you're rebuilding, you might want to go with a blast show esque coach. If you're not, you're probably going to go with John Tortorella or Barry Trotz. And if you're in the middle, you might go with Jim Montgomery or somebody like that. So when it comes to coaching, I guess this is a two part question because we know which way they're going to go. So which way do you think they're going to go? And then which way, because of the answers we just gave, would you decide on the head coach? So from what I've heard, um, it's down to trots and torts. Um, the ball is in trots's court. If he wants to come here, the job is his. Um, he's pretty much si- deciding between here, Vegas, and uh, Winnipeg. Um, if he doesn't end up coming here, torts gets the job. I've heard some reports lately that uh, the boars in the mix. I haven't personally heard that, but I don't want to shoo that away. Maybe that I just haven't heard that. Um, the way I would have went is I never heard of that Mike Vellucci guy until a couple of guys reported that he interviewed with the team, did some research on him. Uh, turned out he was the coach of the Charlotte or not the Charlotte yeah. checkers, the uh, Carolina hurricanes, AHL team. They're yeah, not yeah. The che- what, it was the, uh, was it the checkers? No, it was the checkers. Cause then okay. it switched to the wolves. Yes. Yeah, so That's it was, right. It was the checkers back then. Yeah. So he was the head coach of the checkers and he was the GM of that team. And they were the best team in the league for a couple of years, and they yeah. ended up getting a Calder out of it. And I think he so was at USHL, wasn't he? Well, he was in one of the junior leagues for like a while, wasn't for right. years ago? Yep. Yeah, for like nine years, and he won the coach of the year, I think, in the juniors. So it seems like that guy knows how to develop talent. I mean, we we also heard that with Hackstall. It didn't happen. But from everything I've read and heard, it seems like that would have been the way to go if you were doing a rebuild. Um a former flyer who's kind of making his way up into the coaching ranks. We haven't heard his name much this off season, which kind of disappointed me. Eric Wellwood. Um, he was very good with the Flint flyer birds a couple of years ago. Then the COVID season happened. Uh, now he's with the Greyhounds in the coast and they're putting up good points. Growlers, down there. He was with the growlers. Yeah. Growlers. In the coast. Right. Yeah. He was, he was actually really good too. Cause I talked to their announcer and he would still kick the ass of certain players. They said when they would do the practices, you do the practices with the uh, scratch guys of the ECHL and they would be watching be like, damn, he still looks pretty good out there. <laughs> <All right. laughs> oh, whereas he's like cooking like his scratches for his ECHL team on the ice. Oh, um, wow. <laughs> but no, uh, he, he, he's a fun dude. He, he, it was fun to cover the Royals this year because we're really close to the Growlers and Wellwood, another former flyer is the, 
well, yeah, he's still the coach of the Growlers. We'll see. Maybe since Kirk stepped down, we'll see if anything happens there yeah. in the ECHL going forward because well was a former organization guy if they try to pry him, but we'll uh-huh. see what happens going forward. But either way, I agree. He's been really good. Volucci was kind of one of the guys just because he seemed to be the rebuilding guy. It didn't work with Haxel, but if you're rebuilding, you could try it because – from what I read out of Seattle, it seems like Hackstall's message is right, similar to what they say out of Arizona. Tourney's message is right. It's just now you got to get him the guys that will actually yeah. do well with that message. You can't have a bunch of C-plus and C-minus level guys that think you're going to do anything. So you have to now build around the coach's message, basically. But I, I'm kind of with you on that. I think it's going to be trots or torch, which I don't have a problem with it. It's just the only reason I do is I don't think they're going to be good. Like, I don't mind Trotz or Torch as a head coach. It's just I don't think it's going to work for the Flyers because, like, Trotz and Torch make every team better, but to make the Flyers better, you're probably just doing what we said at the beginning, making them a solid bubble team with the expanded playoffs. So unless if they strike Dallas Stars or Canadians, like, playoff run stuff, they're not going to really go anywhere. So that's kind of – issue I have hiring those head coaches is kind of a waste of time almost in a sense if you don't somehow turn it around quickly like others like some do believe uh but I I I don't see it as quickly the only way I see us turning it around quickly is if health is spot on like if Ryan Ellis can somehow stay on the ice for 70 games next year uh, that would really help and I don't foresee that happening just because of bad luck and just his unfortunate injury bug I hope he stays on the ice for 82 games or 70 but it's just you can't probability it yeah yeah so that's the worry i have that's why i would lean the Volucci's or blast shows because i think blast show honestly did good in detroit he kind of got pulled out under him from steve eiserman but that's a different story for i, I would have been okay with blast show as well yeah i like i think he's good with the kids i think it's just yeah. certain kids like zadina just because zadina didn't develop you can name a bunch of other guys that did do well with black blast show. So like, and Zadine is a guy that's still in there, I think 23. So he still has a lot of time to try to become something. He's not going to become probably what they expect in the draft to become something very meaningful. So I think the flyers, that's why I don't like, I would like trots more than torch just because I think trots with the way the flyers need to play will be better with torch. Just going to be that Ruhaha aggressive, aggressive thing where I don't know if that'll work with the flyers as much as the let's play good defense aggressively to yeah. do our offense. So I feel like Torch is going to try to turn guys more physical when they're just not that. Like, Bobby Brink's never going to hit somebody off the puck <laughs> seven feet. Like, yeah. that's just not going to happen. So, like, there's certain coaches that I think don't work with a roster. And I feel like that's the reason I don't love Tortorella with Philly because I'm not sure how well he works with them. Mine is Cam Atkinson, obviously. Him and Cam Atkinson are boys. But if you're not Cam Atkinson, I'm not sure how he necessarily – fits with that or TK because TK is basically a younger Atkinson. So like how he works with like the other guys around him that are not really like, you're never going to see these guys play. Like they can play aggressive their style, but they're not going to really play that. What you would quote unquote, the John Tortorella style. Like you're not going to see Bobby Brink fighting. And, <laughs> but like, if, so like you're going to need <laughs> to see how he fits in and how certain guys fit in Kate you might because but but not really he's more of a defensive guy but Torch loves defensive guys so that'll negate him from worrying about anything else yeah. where Brink it'll be an interesting guy to follow if we hire Torch because he's not the best defensively he's still learning defensively good offensively Torch doesn't tend to overplay guys that are only good offensively but kind of piss them off defensively so it'll be kind of interesting to see what goes on with Brink if we did hire Tortorella because um, I felt like he did that with uh, Columbus that's all I wanted to say I'm all for trots. The guys I mentioned earlier was kind of my picks. If we were actually rebuilding, like I want to, it's pretty obvious at this point, Chuck Fletcher is not going to rebuild. So I have no problem with trots. That's probably the guy I would go with. Torts worries me in a sense that we just got rid of AV who we all saw the team quit on him a year and a half into his tenure here. And trot or not trots. Uh, John Tortorella is kind of like, AV to a whole nother level, you know, like if, if AV lost the locker room that quick, how quick is torts going to lose it? And you could say, well, that just shows you they have to move on from some guys. I do agree with that. I would like to see a lot of turnover with this roster. Um, I don't know. It's, it is definitely interesting. Yeah. I think the biggest interesting guy that we might move on from, the one guy I wouldn't move on from because I think he's going to keep ascending and you're at the risk of doing the whole Adam Pellick 
because he's ascending in his mid twenties if you move on from Sanheim. Yeah. But Provy's kind of starting to talk like an ass. Yeah. And isn't playing well. So there's a <laughs> there's a there's a two way street that makes me go. I still really liked you from when we drafted you. Love that you had that whole story of you were the first guy at the gym. They would give you the key to the gym. Well, I love how you're a puck hound guy, but at the same time, that can't mean you're, as Eminem would say, a cocky prick <laughs> when uh, you haven't done anything. Yeah, so, when you're when you're yeah. whining about getting taken off the power play and you don't want to take any accountability, I mean that's just gonna that's not a good look. No, and that's the issue. Like how we keep like that. Like, let's be honest. Sometimes the media has very pointed questions that are not the most polite. But that one I thought, and it was from Jordan. Like the fact that the question he got mad at was from Jordan, <laughs> who's one of the nicest people yep. you will ever meet on the planet. Like that's kind of what, like if it was somebody that you're used to, like if it was the Howard Eskin equivalent of hockey, you would be used to getting kind of beat down by that person. So it makes sense to sometimes bounce back at them. Yeah. But for somebody like, like I understand why it's because it was the question over again, but like, the only reason people are asking him the question is because you were bad. You were good in the final month of the season, but if you were good, nobody's going to ask, oh, how come you very much depleted your play this year? Nobody's going to ask that question if you were good. <laughs> so, like, I think that's kind of what Provy just needs to realize. He needs to get to the next level of maturity, which is realizing the only reason people are on you this hard is Philly is a town that cares more than most others. So they're going to be on you as much as they love you when you're doing good. So I think that – and he saw it with Ghost, his partner, years ago. Ghost had that season with Provy. He went off, and then afterwards he wasn't as good defensively because of leg injuries and everybody got on him. And then he yes. had a decent final year, and then he had a good year in Arizona this year. So I think you just have – I think the one issue, and I don't know if you would agree with this, but I do find that a percentage of our fan base is not the best at is just knowing who somebody is. From a personality standpoint? Like from, a, from like, no, 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 like knowing who they are from a player standpoint. Like you would have people with Shane Goss despair, like, oh, my God, how come he's still not good at defense? And it's like. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Completely he's agree. not good at defense. He's yeah. Defense. Like he's a straight up offensive defenseman. Like there's just certain things that people's wishes and desires will be stuff that like can't come to fruition because that's just mm-hmm. not who that player is. And that's the stuff that usually will kind of not, not make me annoyed at all or angry because I don't care, but it's more like just. Like, what is this person talking about? Like, there's no way that guy was ever going to shut down Austin Matthews. <laughs> he can't shut down freaking Austin Scott if that was somebody's name in the NHL. <laughs> so, like, like he's all offense. So, like, I think there's some of that too much. But I think going forward, and this is kind of the thing I want to talk about before the free agency, there's a couple guys. Like if I had to keep list, I would say you have to keep Sanheim there for this year. Obviously, you're keeping I, – I would keep Carter Hart for now and then see mm-hmm. how him and Fedotov uh, platoon together. Um, and then Provy's a wild card. TK to me, I've always liked TK, and I feel like Atkinson and TK together kind of are a good me- – like Atkinson's a good mentor for the way TK's going to continue to develop his game. Mm-hmm. So I feel like keeping TK makes sense. I've always been in the camp of keeping Oscar because I see the human element as much as I see the player element, and if you have that much of a fucking hellhole of a cancer. And we – say like for – I understand it's two years he struggled like Frank and other people – have told me when I've been on Twitter, but he's off of one of the worst cancers on the planet, which is non Hoskins on the phone. But that's why Mirachenko is falling. Mirachenko is not falling in this year's draft because he blows. He's probably actually going to be one of the best players of the draft. He's falling because he just had non Hoskins on the and the NHL just saw that Limblum looked better on the yep. ice as the season progressed. But it's, but it's probably going to take Mirachenko as a kid as long, maybe even longer because he's not as mature as Oscars in his mid 20s to kind of get all the strength back. So, <laughs> That doesn't mean he's not going to be good. I still think Oscar will be good next year, honestly, and get going again. And then Mirchenko will probably need one year as a kid again to play fully and then see where he is, like in the junior somewhere, and then see where he is after that. But th- those two are just perfectly comparable. That's why I wouldn't trade Oscar. And also, if somehow Ivan falls at the end of the first round, I would try to use some of your picks next year and trade to the end of the first to try to grab him because if you can get him and whoever you get fifth say that's your check you get a defenseman that's really good plus you got a forward that's really good so that kind right. of negates your uh a few of your issues here so uh that's kind of just the way i look at that but the keep the biggest keeper for me would be tk and sanheim i think just because where Lindblom is more on the i don't want to see another patrick sharp 
trait where I think yeah. he has the best chance to turn into that. So that's the other reason why I don't want to move him. With a guy that I definitely want to get rid of is JVR. And then if for some reason somebody wants Rasmus versus the line, uh, <laughs> that, that would be nice too. So Yeah, I'm wondering – I would love to get rid of Risto as well. I just – I wonder if that ship sailed. Because, I mean, you you could have saved that $5 million and then yeah. you could have went after Klingberg or, like, Latang. Like, we could get into this in a little bit, but, like, Latang oh, would be a really – You can get into really, it now because, yeah, that's what we're going to go to next. So, go ahead. Yeah, Latang would be such a good fit on this roster. A, a defenseman who can get the puck out, who has playoff experience, winning experience. He's going to keep that locker room accountable, like – and then you went and signed Risto, and now it's, you got so much money uh, the other up problem in the I defense. Had is there's about 65 Rasmus Risto lines that are not $5 million in this year's free agency. Erica yep. Branson's one of them. He gets paid usually at most $2 million. He does exactly right. the same thing. So just because he is like 31, but it doesn't make a difference because you're only signing a guy to fill that role for a couple of years. Like the Flyers were trying to, I think, find – like something that's not really in today's game, which is finding that big body defenseman you can have that you're going to develop is great for five years. There's only like a select few that are the shot blocking old school defensemen that are still really good at it. And it's usually not even close to a $5 million pay scale in today's game. Like the, like the branches of the world, the, uh, um, what's that one guy's name? The Dorovs of the world, like all those guys that just finally developed, figured out their game well enough to just be that like the coaches said look you can't you're not going to do anything in the offensive zone if you want to stay in the nhl be great defensively block shots and get in the way of the lanes where risto is too inconsistent is doing that because he's still trying to be the offensive guy he was drafted to be while trying to be that the way i think the flyers could honestly make risto his best is just by telling him screw offense be the be erica branson yeah. and try to see how that works because it's not working right now. Now, maybe we can put you in one-timer positions or now and again in front of the net because that worked on the power play a couple of times. I would have liked to see that more than net front Risto like Buffalo did, yep. but that's not really offense. That's just power play. So overall offense on five on five, I would just tell Risto, use your body more defense, worry about that more. We're going to put you on a line with, I don't know, Cam York, and to let somebody that's more of an offensive defense and be the guy and you stay the hell back. Because I feel like that might be the best to develop him. Because right now he's just caught in like this limbo land where Ristolainen's by something like, like like me. I still don't consider him a law school. I don't think he's like an F player, like I do, or a D. I think he's probably like a C to a C player that plays good shot block and gets a puck off the stick. But that's not a five million dollar player. That's the only problem. It's it's not. Yeah. It's not risk line, and it's more the tag that Chuck Fletcher played paid risk line. If you paid him two million dollars for five years, what I like that he's still here for five years. That might be a little long, but like the fact that it's two million dollars, I'm not yeah. going to care about the cap. Here. Yeah, I was just about to say the same thing. I think a lot of fans wouldn't get on him as much if he was making two, three million, and he was just a third pairing defenseman. I mean, you look at the teams in the Cup right now. Uh, you got Bogosian on the Lightning. They had Luke Shen for a while. You look at the Avalanche with. Um, Eric Johnson, like you, you can, you can win with them kind of players as long as you hold back their ice time and you kind of reserve them. And we wouldn't, we wouldn't get on as much if he wasn't getting paid as much and had a lesser role. Yeah. And I think that's the big issue. I do think the flyers, if they play their cards right with JVR have a chance to, uh, Maybe get they're not going to get a top defenseman by any stretch of the imagination, unless they somehow <laughs> find a way to get Chris Tang. But I don't see them trying him. That would be a dream come true. If yeah, it yeah. Happened from the uh, Penguins or Evgeny Malkin for that matter. Since he's been there. <laughs> uh, but the I, if those one of those two things happen or both, definitely don't see both happening. Uh, that would be nice. But when it comes to the Flyers, I think next year. This is why I don't understand the way they're going with the coaching because next year when you look at their – especially their defense score, I agreed with re-signing Seward because I think he's a fine seventh, eighth. He played fine this year. What's his name? Played absolutely atrocious. Connaughton, but Sealer played fine. Uh, Zamula uh, was fine in 10 games. So we'll see how he can – I think he could use maybe a wee bit more AHL time, but I think he'll probably make the team just because Ronnie Adder definitely needs more AHL time. So I think that'll they'll probably flip those two. Right. Uh, York – um, oh, should make the team right away. I don't know why the hell he would be in the AHL. And then Risto and Sandheim, 
I don't think Shanahan has to stay with Risto because I don't think Risto did anything for Shanahan. I think Shanahan did everything for Risto. Yeah, I agree. Opinion. So I think you could move Shanahan up if Provy still struggled. But Provy's the biggest thing because if you want to really turn this around quickly, trading Yvonne Provorov might be your best way to do it because you're still going to get value for Yvonne Provorov where the only guy I think you're getting mammoth value for on this team is probably Provy. Unless we trade Joel, but you're not going to trade Joel. So <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah. So like, it'd be like I think I think it's Provy. Yeah, I mean, I it's tough because like we know how good Ivan can be if he has that stud partner next to him. Like you mentioned earlier, we saw with Ghost the one year, we saw with Niski the one year. Him and Braun just weren't a good fit, and Braun's a fine third pair defenseman, but. It's so tough because then, you know, some things started coming out. Maybe he's not the greatest guy in the locker room. He started whining when they took away his power play time. Like, if that's the case, then it's probably time to move on and you try flipping him in a hockey trade. Maybe you try getting the brinket out of it. Or we've heard Barzell's name in rumors, Mark Shifley. Like, try to get, like, like I mentioned earlier, one of them high-end elite talents that this team drastically needs. Um but yeah, like at the same time, it's like, man, you know how good Provy can be. Maybe you can pry Chickren out of Arizona. I'd be all for that. I think that dude's a stud. Um, yeah. And then that kind of replaces Provorov's role. And then you go forward, maybe Provorov, Ellis, Sanheim, Risto. I still don't love that. Um, I don't know. Like it, you know, kind of just talked about a perfect world. Provorov, Latang, first pair. Uh Sanheim Ellis second pair if Ellis stays healthy and then maybe you're like your third pair is like York and Jan Ruda out of Tampa yeah that makes sense um no I, I agree I think it's just about finding out the right clips but as we're wrapping up into our final um 10 minutes here and I definitely have you on again to, you, you're welcome on as much as you want to be on I know you're busy with the podcast with Coatsy and it, well not Coach but Cote there we go I knew I would do that <laughs> I, knew, I, knew, I knew I would do that because Coatsy was just on um but with Riley um I'm gonna put in with him too because he has that contact section of his website I want mm-hmm. to reach out to Riley to just talk about some business stuff but I'll do but that's something um, I'll do in the future he makes his website so easy too oh yeah his website <laughs> yeah. is one of the easiest I've ever navigated in my life but anyway back to our closing points for the uh, flyers but I agree with you. I think rebuilding is the best stretch to go. I don't think they're going to go that way. If I had to guess because Trotz, I think, is smarter than this and is going to realize we're not the right fit right now with the way the direction team, I would say Torch is going to be the head coach by default because if I'm Barry and I had to choose between the three teams you gave, I'm not picking up. Yep. So, like, that, that, it's, that, it sucks, really but it's the is. truth. Yeah, that's really just what it is. But Unless you overpay the crap out of them. That's true. Yeah, they could do that, but then you're going to get people on them like, oh, well, you had to overpay because you are so bad <laughs> yep. right now in the <laughs> NHL culture that you had to overpay for that. Like, so either way, they're just going to get trashed if that's the case. So, like, yeah. But I don't know if you had any closing up points, any players uh, that you wanted to touch on. Uh, the next one, we'll have to do more of the free agency because we only have about eight minutes left on the Zoom. So the next time I have you on, we'll go yeah. to the free agency. Um, there are a lot of free agents I like out there. I mean, we just traded the captain Claude Giroux. So we have a hole at that top line left wing spot, hometown kid, Johnny's hot, Johnny hockey's out there. Philip Forsberg's a pending UFA, the Brinkett's names in trade talks. I think you have to get one of them guys. Uh, that solves the, that solves a part of the elite talent problem that this team lacks. Um, maybe Johnny wants to come home. Yeah. The best one, I think, would be if we're trying to be good for the foreseeable, would be Cat, just because he's only 24. Where obviously Johnny is not that old either. I think they're 28 to 29, I think, yep. with Forsberg to Goudreau. But I also think, kind of, with the way the Flyers need a player, Philippe Forsberg's play style might fill their needs better, where Johnny Goudreau is more of a affluent playmaker. Where Philippe Forsberg is a decent playmaker, but a great shot. Where the Flyers have been lacking a great shot since pretty much Jeff Carter. So, like, I think that's something uh, they could kind of use a little bit. But I agree. I think any of those guys would be huge because the Brinkett's basically the double guy that has a great shot, but also is very good at playmaking. So is Goudreau, but Goudreau 
Goudreau more than Cat, though, I think just from watching both, would like to pass more than not, but then has a great shot when he chooses to shoot it. So yeah. it's, kind of, it's a little bit of a different uh, mindset there. But either way, you're going to be fine with uh, all three of those guys. But I thank you for joining, Trav. Have you had any uh, Twitter handles or anything you wanted to share out? I've ha- handed over to you now for that. Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at TraviBallin26, covering the team over there. A lot of fun. Uh, YouTube at TraviBallin. I post a lot of different – content over there i have my own podcast uh, i post videos from up in the press box i had a highlight player uh highlight clips of players all that kind of crazy stuff yeah your highlight clips are always i remember watching those from you would have the cool zoom out one where you see here the player and it would be like the cool camera that i would like the camera angles we would always get when we would go because you're on your phone and you're trying to record the player and you're like okay let me get this as good as possible <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I can, so it's always it's always the grind but thanks for joining you can find me at jj Boric 26 sports fanatic news for steel flyers side of things check it out at steel flyers uh flyers nitty gritty as well and then if you're into music, check out the old genre music fest and stay tuned for more stuff from me musically coming out in the near future. Not going to reveal any of that yet to y'all because it's going to keep your bet beaks wet. There we go. If I can speak the English language, <laughs> peace out everybody and stay safe.